Judith lives up the street. She's here about every six weeks to see how we're doing it wrong. And she walked into the sample room the other day and she said, Ildiko, what's this shit? And Ildiko said, same shit you used to make Mrs. Lieber only better. Judith Lieber is probably one of the last luxury American manufacturers left. Describe it as a piece of jewelry or a piece of luggage? It's a piece of jewelry. The techniques in terms of the way the bags are made, and there are two types. There's what we refer to as cut and sewn bags, which are hand stitched out of different materials, um, using skins or embroideries, or you have bags that are set with Swarovski crystals. So they're all very, very precious material bags. Judith started making handbags on her own in 1963. She had originally started making handbags during the war. In Hungary, Jews were not allowed to have any kind of executive jobs. So she went to a factory, a handbag factory, and Hungary at the time had its own guild. She learned to make handbags there. She became the first female craftsperson in Hungary. And she became a GI bride, came to the United States after the war. In fact, she worked for the most prestigious handbag company at the time, which was Nettie Rosenstein. In fact, Judith made Mamie Eisenhower's inaugural bag with the Nettie Rosenstein label. And eventually, she got fed up working for other people, and in 1963, she hung out her own shingle. Judith was a genius, but she did everything herself. She did costing, purchasing, so she selling. Was really hands -on. When she left, I brought in a young designer. She's 33 years old. She's had experience both at the lower end of the design price point and the higher end. And she's been able to take things that Judith did and go into Judith's archives and work with colors that Judith would never have considered. Swarovski, who now are very, very involved in the fashion business, had a very limited color palette when Judith was running the business. They had probably seven, eight colors. They now have 30 colors in terms of stones. So suddenly, you can take a crystal bag and paint a picture on it in tones and semitones, which you could never do before. So suddenly, the, it, it allows a much greater interpretation of fashion with something which before had limitations. In the very beginning, it, it felt like, oh my God, what am I going to do? How are we going to you know, pull the collection together? And, and um, the first collection here, for me, um, we were on an extremely tight timetable, so it was, you just had to jump in and go with your gut and do it, you know, and that's where, and certainly there's a tremendous amount of help. I mean, you've been through the factory, so you've seen, it's a wonderful sample room. Um, the factory itself is fabulous. I spend most of my time down there anyway, so yes. it's it's really, you know, working with the guys, is, is this going to work? This is my next idea. What do you think about that? Talking to Freddie about the skins, you know, I want to do this in alligator. Is it too big? Is it too small? Do we have to seam it? You know, you really get the into... The practicalities of it. Exactly. But is it more like designing jewelry or more like designing fashion? Uh, it's extremely technical. We are the last that really does what we do. Um, most handbags that you see today have maybe six to eight different pieces in it and ours have over a hundred pieces to make the bag between the frame covers the locks the hardware the chains um, the gusset constructions the interior linings the way the whole bag is put together just on the third floor not even going down to the beading factory um, you really you don't just design like oh you know I want a poofy drawstring you're, you're starting from the metal frame you're like starting from, you that, from the well enough. but that's poofy is that the same word as it is in the uh, you know, I don't know everywhere else. For me, it's just a non-constructed, very soft bag, and that's not what we do here. And there's a lot of very technical people that are jumping in there saying, 
that's not going to work. Really? So, yes. Well, that's half the battle with great design anyway. Yeah. Most of the fun is where you take it to the world. Oh, sure. And the first thing they say is, my God, we can't do that. And then, and then they, they can, they can. That's yeah, the process, which I actually really enjoy. I mean, I think the, the best part for me is the time downstairs. I mean, that's the time that I enjoy the most. Every single thing we make, we don't do first samples like most other people do. Yes. The first sample is a finished sample that gets sold, so there's really no room for playing around the first go around. It needs to be pretty well thought out on so paper the first. So first sample is basically it's a like a it's a final piece. It's a yeah. One off. Exactly. And then if it works, exactly. then, you, then it goes off. And, and then goes. it goes on into other different materials, and then the patterns get modified depending on the different skins and the things that you're going to make it out yes. of, and you go from there. I didn't realize that you actually started with metal boxes. Yes. And then you build a bag from a metal yes. box. I would have thought it would have been more a frame construction and then you put panels rather than a, a firm construction. Well, there's, there's two different, th we have three different types of boxes. There's seamless ones that are more what you're saying where it's a form piece first where it's a stamp. Some of them are stamp combinations with castings and they're soldered together. Then there's the lesser expensive boxes, but they were soft-sided where they're done a double construction with a brass frame and then the aluminum sides, yes. which we pad and cover. So there's like that combination God. as well. And then all of those things start really from um, a spec drawing, a technical drawing where you're doing the dimensions and the size or a wax mold. If it's you know an owl or a penguin or something, it'll start from an actual piece of sculpture of an idea first that and gets put send, into... And then you send it to Italy to And we send it to Italy and then they, they do the stamping based on that and then send it back here. Um, and then we work out how we're going to do the lining, you know, because you're lining a penguin. You know, it, it's that's a whole thought process in and of itself. Um, and then the painting and beading and the design part of it is the, really the end part at that, at that stage of the game. So how long have you been doing this? Uh, here, three years. And was it a, a big a big headache to walk into something like this? Well, when I was um, a buyer, I was familiar with the product for many years on the other side. So um, it wasn't like a complete Were you dealing unknown. with Judith back in those mm -hmm. days? Sure. And sure. so how was, what was her reaction sure. when she found out you were going to be doing um, this? By the time I got here, she had already sold the company. She had retired. She hadn't been here for over a year. Does she come and bug you about things? Like she doesn't bug me. No, she'll come through and she'll walk through the factory occasionally, talk to the guys. You know, she'll talk to the framers. She'll see what's going on. She'll go back in the sample room, check out what's happening there. You know, that type of thing. So, she's still there. She she comes less and less. She made beautiful products and they lasted. And she'd go on a public appearance and a woman would come and say, Mrs. Lieber, I bought this 15 years ago. See how great it is. And she says, it's time you bought another one. 